So we still have one more great case to go. This will be another recorded case from Dr. Tim Betts and his colleagues from Oxford. And his, he'll be showing us a case on global substrate mapping and targeted ablation with a novel gold tip catheter in de novo precision AFib. And just like the previous case, first we're gonna show the recorded case and then at the very end, we'll have a Q&A session. I do again wanna note that the mapping system that's gonna be shown here is FDA approved, but the ablation catheter is not FDA approved. So with that, let's go ahead and move on. Our case today is a 74-year-old lady with recurrent persistent atrial fibrillation. She is highly symptomatic. She's had two cardioversions and relapsed despite amiodarone. She has a dilated left atrium but otherwise normal heart. We're using the AccuMap imaging and mapping system as well as the AccuBlate force sensing ablation catheter and RF generator. We are using general anesthesia with jet ventilation. Three or four femoral punctures are required and this is the AccuRef sheath through which we put the coronary sinus catheter and it also acts as an indifferent electrode. With an ACT of 350 or more, we then do a transeptal puncture with the SL0 catheter to get access to the left atrium. Over the wire, we exchange that for the AccuGuide steerable sheath and through that we're going to pass the AccuMap mapping catheter. This is the AccuBlate force sensing catheter which is irrigated and will be inserted through the agilis and then fed across the septum alongside the previous transeptal wire. We then prep the AccuMap mapping catheter with its 48 crystals for ultrasound geometry creation and the 48 electrodes for the biopotential mapping. That is passed up the AccuGuide sheath and opened up inside the left atrium. And you can see the temperature probe. The next step is to create the left atrial geometry. By rotating the mapping catheter gently around the chamber, the 48 transducers send out over 100,000 beams per minute to create a highly detailed geometry. By rotating it and moving it, you get different lines of sight to help build up the more complex anatomy. A small amount of post-processing is done, including a valve cutout. This whole part takes no more than two to three minutes maximum. If you like, you can add to the geometry with a vein build using a lasso catheter or ablation catheter in the more traditional impedance tracking contact geometry. And sometimes that helps delineate complex anatomy uh, and also separate the appendage from the left superior vein. Here we show mapping of the left atrium prior to any ablation. The green orb is a tool to guide the catheter to the centre of the chamber. And we typically record a segment of about a minute from which 10 second maps of AF propagation are calculated following subtraction of the QRS and T wave as you see here. And this generates a propagation map where the red band represents the leading edge of the wavefront. And we'll look for regions of, of complex activation patterns, which we then mark on the, the surface. This includes rotational activation or more frequently irregular patterns with repeated slowing, changing direction, splitting uh, or pivoting uh, within a confined zone. And you'll see over this recording all of these uh, phenomena on both that posterior wall near the left lower pulmonary vein and on the anterior wall here as we're marking that out. And we'll always look at at least two separate uh, segments to identify those areas with the most stable or consistent uh, phenomena. And as you can see on this second map 
these complex patterns are repeated in these areas, a number of rotational patterns you saw there on the anterior wall and, and similarly through that posterior wall. And AccuTrack, which I know isn't available in the US, uh, but can be used to highlight some of these zones and can be useful just to confirm your visual interpretation, which is frequently how we use it. After the first atrial fibrillation map, pulmonary vein isolation was then performed. The AccuMap catheter was exchanged for a circular mapping catheter to get real-time PV electrograms. I was aiming for a FTI of 400 and using 40 watts. We were able to get first pass isolation with both the right and left pulmonary veins. Following PVI we repeat a map of the AF and we're looking here both for consistency with those zones seen prior to ablation and for how the PVI may have altered the substrate. And you'll see if we focus on the anterior wall here initially there's repeated slowing in this zone with pivoting or rotational activation over repeated wavefronts. And similarly on the posterior wall near the left lower pulmonary vein encirclement there's isochronal bunching consistent with slowing conduction in this region with frequent rotational activations and very similar to what we saw prior to ablation. We proceeded here to deliver further non-pulmonary vein uh, ablation and our approach was to first target the region on the posterior wall mainly because it could easily be joined with the, the pulmonary vein encirclement and one of the advantages of the, of the system is that it's then very quick and easy to remap and assess the effect of therapy at each stage and here the slowing and rotational activation is still very prominent on the anterior wall but you can see quite nicely how the pattern on the posterior wall is changed although you do now see there's this channel of, of slow conduction between the cluster here and the, the right pulmonary veins which may be important. So we delivered another cluster of lesions to the anterior wall and again repeated a, a map which confirmed what we'd noticed previously showing a channel of conduction on the posterior wall which prompted us then actually to complete a line along the, the low posterior wall. And after completing those lesion sets you can hopefully appreciate how the overall AF pattern has changed uh, at this point. There's no longer the same irregular pattern here on the anterior wall and instead these broader wavefronts that appear to more passively rotate around the edge of the ablated area uh, are seen and we felt at this stage that there weren't any more targets in the left atrium uh, and therefore elected to look at the right atrium. More and more we are now mapping the right atrium. It's very easy to pull the catheter back and just takes a couple of minutes to do a right atrial ultrasound geometry. Again a little bit of post-processing, cutting out the tricuspid valve and then performing an AFib map with the catheter in the centre of the chamber. What we found in this case was there was relatively striking focal firing from the lateral wall seen in the left hand RAO view. Here's another segment from that one minute recording and you can see in the centre there very repetitive focal firing. So the ablation catheter was steered there presumably somewhere mid Christa terminalis and a cluster of RF lesions at 40 watts were delivered. Whilst delivering this RF energy the AFib organised into a regular tachycardia. So we chose to do a supermap Supermap is the algorithm used for regular stable tachycardias but it is still a non-contact map. But by gently moving the AccuMap catheter around the chamber so it's within a few millimetres of the surface you collect very high resolution, high density recordings. But I would stress it's still a non-contact global map. The geometry is coloured in to show you when you've gathered enough the post-processing looks at cycle length of each beat and the coronary sinus electrogram morphology and it puts these into bins so that you can eliminate ectopics or sinus beats if it's non-sustained and build up a superimposed map. Here's the propagation map 
of the arrhythmia and you can see it's a lovely example of a counterclockwise cavotricuspid isthmus dependent flutter. Now it only took a couple of minutes to do the supermap which was fortunate because while we were looking at it it degenerated back into atrial fibrillation but as we already knew the circuit we chose to undertake a cavotricuspid isthmus line regardless while still in AFib. Whilst doing this and delivering energy to the CTI, the AFib organized once again into a regular tachycardia, but the CS pattern looked slightly different and longer cycle length. So we repeated the supermap, which just took another two to three minutes of rovering around the chamber, and you can see it's completely different, emerging from the left side into the septum, going into the isthmus and blocking, and at the same time going around the top of the chamber and down the lateral wall. So it's a left atrial circuit with isthmus block. I therefore fed the mapping cafter back into the left atrium and performed a three minute left atrial super map. You can see from the images here that this now shows a counterclockwise mitral flutter. It also shows us in the right hand window that that low left atrial posterior wall line is blocked. We tried to confirm this with entrainment but it was actually quite hard to get reliable capture at a number of sites. But based on the supermap I chose to extend that mid wall cluster to create an anterior mitral line. Whilst ablating down to the annulus the cycle length slowed a little and then when completing the top the tachycardia terminated and sinus rhythm was restored. We then performed pacing from the left atrial appendage and did another supermap and as you can see here there is a gap in that mitral line near the right upper pulmonary vein. You can see the wave front moving through. So I did more ablation and tried to get block, repeated the pacing from the appendage and now this activation sequence looks slightly different. There's a sudden flash below the line rather than the trickle through. And we see this sometimes with this line. What it is is activation actually going round the back across into the right atrium and then back through the, the septum below the line rather than trickling through. Finally, we then check the pulmonary veins with the PV mapping catheter and demonstrated entrance and exit block. So to summarize, after pulmonary vein isolation, propagation maps of AFib were used to map and ablate the left atrium and the right atrium. After organization, super maps were used to ablate right atrial and left atrial flutter and check for linear lesion block. A total of 10 maps were done and the whole case from femoral puncture to finish was just over two hours. Fantastic case. Um, so this is very nice. Both uh, Tim and uh, Michael Pope are both joining us uh, for this case. So Tim, Michael, th thanks again and congratulations. It was a beautiful, complex case. Um, so how did the patient do, by the way? Any, any follow-up or is this still early? Well, we only did it two weeks ago, so it's hot <laughs> off the press. Um, actually, in reference to the uh, Watson Flex, we did it as a day case. Uh, so she went home that evening and yeah. no bad phone calls yet. <laughs> well, no, that's great. Well, you know, one of the things I've been impressed with the system, because we do have availability of the system in the U.S., is its flexibility, the ability to do different kinds of mapping, which you highlighted in your case. Um, but we have not actually had the opportunity to, to use the ablation catheter, the irrigated catheter, the gold tip. That, uh, that you used in your case. Can you just tell us a little bit about that catheter in terms of its handling and any other thoughts you have about it? Um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, um, it's handling, it's pretty much like most other ablation catheters. It's uh, the one I've been using is unidirectional. It's quite a soft catheter, so it's best used through a long sheath, but that's absolutely fine. I mean, we do have AFIBs using an Agilis. Um, it's 
I mean, I think one of the advantages, as well as using it for your 3D mapping systems, is it's a, it's a standalone system as well. So if you want to use it for an SVT or for a flutter without 3D mapping, you can still get the force information mm -hmm. uh, from the standalone unit. So, and with the gold tip, I mean, it's been great. I've not had any steam pops or any char formation yet. So yeah, it's quite handy to use. And Tim, do you want to comment on the advantage of having gold instead of platinum maybe? Well, I don't know if we get as much for our recycling as we did when we used to send the tips back for platinum. But I, yeah, I, under, I, I understand that there's a long history that the, the gold is, is meant to have better um, sort of conductive parameters for RF ablation. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's interesting, Will. I, I think it's going to be part of an IDE trial here in the United States uh, sometime soon. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, as you're going through the case and I saw your left atrial lesion set, the first thought that went into my mind was, oh my goodness, this patient may come back with a mitral flutter because, you know, you had that ablation a little bit in the anterior wall and, and it's, a, it's something that we're seeing more and more of, right? And I've actually have gone over to, you can call it the dark side or whatever, but I've certainly have agreed with Pierre that it's probably worthwhile doing a, a, a mitral line in most, if not all, persistent uh, AFib patients. I'm just wondering, and this is both to you, Tim, as well as anyone else on the panel, what are your thoughts about the utility and, 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 and what are your thoughts about the mitral line in, in persistent patients? I mean, I, I think you're right in that uh, if it's anything more than just a tiny focus of lesions, you wonder about the proarrhythmic effect of a macro macroarrhythmic tachycardia. Um, so I would say that more often than not, we end up completing a line either across the posterior wall or to the mitral annulus. Where I've changed is I now by choice do my mitral line from the right superior to the septal mitral annulus. Rather, I spent years doing the lateral from the isolated left veins to the uh, sort of three o'clock, four o'clock position. And sometimes that works, but more often than not, you're in the coronary sinus. Now, I need to learn how to do ethanol ablation as the vein of Marshall because sometimes getting blocks really tough. But yeah. maybe I should just change position because that area on the anterior wall there near the septum is a very consistent uh, area we target with the acutus mapping because of the rotational activity, the pivoting, the localized irregular activity, which I think is quite key to the substrate. Uh, Tim, can I also just ask you on that? Because I shifted over about three years ago to routinely uh, shifting from a posterior lateral mitral isthmus line to an anterior to anteroceptal line, like you uh, point out. I think it's worth pointing out for the audience how critical it is that the line on the anterior left atrium, which is so easy to do because it's up against the aorta and it gives you very firm resistance all the way along, excellent contact, but not to do what many groups have shown um, can bring about significant hematodynamic consequences, particularly with respect to very late activation of the left atrial appendage with the potential for thrombus and stroke formation despite anticoagulation. And that is bringing the anterior line all the way up to the roof line. And furthermore, when you are coming up to the right pulmonary vein where you had your gap, that frequently is a spot uh, where gaps occur and it's a fairly rich um, uh, input area for the Backman's bundle and ultimately the postreceptor bundle, which comes across, so you get an epicardial bridging. And I like it, your very clear pacing uh, demonstration of the involvement of Backman's bundle, which as you know, can separate out as a separate bridge and break away from the roof of the LA and the RA and actually have fat in between the endocardium that you see on the inside of the heart and the outside, there could be a fatty layer between the two. But clinically, how often have you seen a macro macro, if I can use that uh, double macro word, um, our biatrial flutter occurring as a result of the antroceptal line that you uh, did so nicely. And, and there was a, is it much of a clinical problem? I've, I've had a couple of cases myself. I think inevitably it will come. I don't think I've seen it as often as when we've been left with gaps or we've had gaps recur in the lateral mitral line. I mean, we do have some nice examples, actually, of when we really struggle to get block along that line. And even with the ablation catheter, sometimes you can see the far field right atrium pre preceding and you suddenly realize, well, actually, no, the left side, the left atrial component is actually blocked, but it's just taking a root over the top. 
And I think the secret to that is not to go too low down near the septum and, if anything, sort of curve round over the roof to the mitral annulus rather than get too much towards the right side. I, mean, I, I think I agree with most of the things you said, David, but I'm still not convinced that the anterior line, at least in my hands, is durable enough uh, compared to the posterior line. I, I'd actually, especially with the utilization of alcohol, I actually tend to favor the posterior line better because I, I think that we can get more durability there. Um, I think I think you're absolutely right, Vivek. If you use an yeah. ethanol in the vein of Marshall, well, then that makes a lot of sense. But for folks who are not uh, familiar with that technique, I think we're just limited to radio frequency mm -hmm. applications for all the issues that have been made clear over the last decade or so. Um, it can be quite challenging. And even if you use Carl Heinz Cook's original um, anterior line from the left posterior vein to the mitral annulus on the other side of the left atrial appendage, you know, it's rather than true posterior lateral, it's more of a lateral to anterolateral line. That can be uh, quite a challenging um, line to achieve just for the three-dimensional geometry and the configuration and uh, uh, trying to achieve even contact force. And then um, obviously for the uh, right pulmonary vein antrum, you clearly have to be aware of the um, right phrenic nerve as a potential downside to the anterior, anterior to anteroceptal line. But technically, although the line is longer, so we've, uh, we've averaged over seven, not average, we have had over seven centimeters of length in a couple of patients on the anterior line, which is typically longer, which would normally be 50 millimeter length for the posterior lateral line. But despite the extra length, it's the ability and the provision of a three-dimensional cushion effect of the aorta that seems to facilitate a fairly um, good contact force without, not, not saying the aorta is not extremely precious, which it clearly is, but compared to the esophagus, it's a lot more forgiving, I think, for a deeper lesion and the posterior wall. If I may jump in, I, I definitely would like to encourage you to um, use um, alcohol injection in the martial vein because it, it will change your opinion and perspective on where to place that line. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, it makes the um, um, lateral usual um, mitral isthmus line the easiest, by the way. Uh, the yeah. amount of RF that is needed in addition to alcoholization of the martial vein is ridiculous. It's like a mean of five minutes. You just have to uh, burn a little bit the uh, typically the uh, ventricular aspect of the line and you're done with a block that is so much more durable than what you can achieve with RF only, that it makes a big difference. I, I suspect it also gives us to um, kill two birds with one stone because I think that uh, this, this vein by itself has some uh, muscles and, and nerves that are participating in the uh, arrhythmogenicity uh, and, and would probably have some extra benefit here. And I, I was wondering, Tim, um, if you could comment on um, whether or not you, you sometimes see large uh, activation fronts with the ectus system that would uh, uh, be like one rotation around the mitral annulus or, or one through the roof. Um, in, in uh, of course, not uh, consistently as you would for a, a flutter. But is this something that you see during AF uh, from time to time? It's actually quite rare. I mean, I thought I would see more of it because sometimes you look at AFib and the coronary sinus electrograms and you think this looks quite organized. It's nearly a flutter. But that may be more of a reflection on the number of inputs into the coronary sinus muscle than what's going on in the left atrium. We've got a, we've got a handful, a handful where it looked almost macro reentrant and repetitive, um, in which case going for a linear sort of compart or compartmentalization, we've just gone for that really early on. Um, but uh, I think that's quite rare. But with the acuter system, what we do look is for something which is consistent and repetitive and present in a number of segments and a number of recordings. And we try not to get too excited by just seeing know a couple of rotations and thinking that's a rotor I'm going to burn there I mean if you're going to burn something it's because it's spatially fixed and repetitive and you think it's a major player in the substrate yeah I, I, I wasn't um, I wasn't uh, thinking of something repetitive but I suspect that 
um, you know, atrial tachycardia mechanisms and AF mechanisms have some overlap. And so I was wondering if, if from time to time you see just one isolated and maybe incomplete rotation, but, you know, some... Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. I mean, Mike, you can comment on that. You've seen thousands of maps. Yeah, no, it's, it's, so I was going to say, um, if, if we look at a number of our, our, our maps, when we've looked at, at a series of very long segments, so the mapping system really, it really is designed to calculate maps of really up to about 10 seconds. But if you put a, a, a number of these segments together and look at the 30 second durations, actually quite within that, you will see uh, segments where it, it it does in a number of cases appear to organize temporarily uh, and i think that's what you're what, what you're alluding to we, so we we definitely get it gets segments where it where it organizes and then that sort of breaks down and degenerates again and actually i think the the degree of organization that you get uh it does does tell something about the the overall properties of the the individual patient that that we're seeing because certainly if we quantify that, those that get more of these organized patterns, we also seem to get more acute terminations of the AF, whereas those at the other end of the spectrum with, with much more chaotic and, and um, with very little organization uh, have different, different properties, I think. I thought your right, right atrial uh, findings were absolutely fascinating. I love the uh, focal or appearance of focal activity within your AFib. Can you comment, uh, either of you, um, on what you think was the substrate there in terms of the three-dimensional re-entry and micro-re-entry that you can have with some in vitro studies to show that that's possible in that territory? And what do you do about um, the pectin muscles? Do you think that um, it's definitely within the crystal, or do you think it involves the pectinate? If it goes into the pectinate and you ablate, you potentially up against really thin right atrial free wall between the pectin muscles where your catheter tip tends to go. Yeah, I, I think the whole right atrium question is, well, it, it's ripe for reinvestigation. And in fact, uh, we should ask Pierre to comment on this, because I think one of the very earliest publications was on right atrial ablation for AFib. And it's, you know, it's all about looking for gaps in the crista, you know, a, a substrate which might promote reentrant loops, whether they're micro or macro reentrant. I, we can't tell with the acutus system whether a focal firing is a true focus and an ectopic or whether it's some micro reentry. And of course, it's often then swamped by the next passing wavefront. Uh, but I suspect it's more, more focal. It's, you know, it's a non PV focus, but you get lots of individual ones. It's quite rare to see something which is really consistent and repetitive, which makes it stand out. So it becomes a target. But I, no, I think there's a large minority of people in whom the right atrium, certainly persistent APIB, the right atrium is quite important. And it, if it's easy to map, we should be looking at that as well. You know, it's a it's an interesting question, the, the right atrium. And I'm sorry, I, I would like Pierre to comment on this, but if you could comment on this, Pierre, in the context of the fact that nowadays, I think you and certainly we are not doing much right atrial ablation at all beyond a CTI. And yet the clinical outcomes don't seem to reflect any uh, negative consequences, right? Yes, I absolutely agree with that. It's um, it's a complex issue, um, more than it may appear at first sight, because you can definitely terminate some atrial fibrillation in the right atrium. But does that mean, I mean, some persistent cases after, uh, after some degree of ablation in the left atrium, but the question is, is this needed for a uh, durable, good, successful outcome after a, a more limited ablation? This is unclear to me. And when we were um, mostly working with the uh, ECGI system to localize targets uh, in addition to PVI, we had about 25 to 30 percent of patients in whom we had to go to the right atrium and and um, ablate there to terminate the arrhythmia but if we look at what we do now which is um, a, a more simple and um, anatomical approach where we have pvi plus the roof line and the mitral isthmus line that includes the alkalization of the martial vein uh, well, the number of cases where 
the right atrium is uh, critical seems to be way much less. And we don't um, really aim to terminate AF. We would convert if needed after that set of lesions in the left atrium. And yet the one term, uh, the, the one year uh, results are excellent, in fact, superior to what we had before. So um, again, I think that um, um, terminating the arrhythmia doesn't mean so much when it comes to atrial fibrillation, probably, unlike what we thought for um, quite some time uh, before. Yeah, probably uh, lesion durability is gonna be the most important thing. I mean, in any event, I mean, th this technology has been studied in, in a non-randomized study on Korea, which was published. Um, Tim, do you want to comment on, I mean, that, and that was certainly interesting data and, and, um, and encouraging, but Tim, do you want to comment on what the next steps are with this technology in terms of the evidence base? Um, yeah, so uh, we've, uh, I think, recently it, it, uh, completed enrollment into Recover AF, which is uh, a registry looking at redo patients. Um, you know, it's kind of different type of patients. You've already dealt with the pulmonary veins to a degree. You hope they're now permanently isolated. What can the system add? There's also the ongoing Discover registry. Another avenue which is being pursued with this is the idea of substrate mapping in sinus rhythm and with pacing. If we look at the models of what we do in VT, uh, looking at uh, you know, voltages in VT or conduction velocities, we can do the same with the acutus system in the atriums of AFib, and there's a pacing protocol, um, it's called the Palasma protocol, where you can look for subtle changes in uh, wave fronts, bunching of isochrone, slow conduction, twisting and turning with paced beats, and see how well they correspond with the phenomena you see in atrial fibrillation, and that might be another way of targeting uh, potential mo maintainers of AF, which might be, might, I think they might develop earlier than the voltage changes we try and pick up with contact mapping. I mean, I'm, I, they, I know, and I believe a lot of the voltage data, but I'm also surprised that how in sinus rhythm, how little scarring I often see when I do a voltage map. But with the acutus system, when you do a, a pacing protocol in sinus rhythm, you can definitely spot areas where there's abnormal conduction. So I wanna, we have a couple Tim, of audience you, questions. Uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask a quick question. I've had, you know, really been impressed with the acutus maps that we've used in extra pulmonary vein foci and, and drivers. Um, and, and we've had really good success with people that have had posterior wall isolation and PV isolation that's durable that still have AFib. I've not had the opportunity to use the AccuTrack uh, software. Can you tell us anything about what that's based upon and how accurate it seems to be in terms of identifying drivers? Yeah, I think it's only fair to let, let Mike ask this because he, um, we use it in combination with our visual assessment, but he's often on the control. So Mike? Yeah, so uh, our, our approach tends to be to, to look at, do a visual assessment first and, and see what we look at, what, what we identify on the, uh, on the maps. The, what the AccuTrack system does is essentially take frame by frame and look at every uh, take the propagation map over each frame and look at uh, each vertex and then the, the algorithm identifies the three patterns which are, are localized rotational activation which is where the propagation rotates around more than 270 degrees or continuous uh, conduction velocity vector change of over 270 degrees within a confined zone the LIA, which is the localized irregular activation uh, pattern, is similarly a change in direction or, or, or slowing and change in direction within a confined zone, but of, of more than 90 degrees and, and less than 270. And then focal activations, which are yeah, spread out centrifugally from a, um, from a, a central vertex. Uh, and if you, just in our experience, look at the maps visually first and compare it to then what what the Acu, what AccuTrack shows you it's it certainly t it tends to be uh, very very consistent where it's occasionally useful is to, to perhaps draw your eye to an area that, that you may not have focused on if you've been looking largely at the anterior wall for example and missed something elsewhere or um, 
something like that. But it's uh, yeah, it's a useful useful tool in that respect. Well, I, I like it because it it's a way of standardizing it. So if you wanted to for a research protocol or compare between centers, you could use it. The other thing is when you do a map and analyze it, and let's say see you see three phenomena, two areas of rotational activity, one of focal firing you can adjust the thresholds with the algorithm so it will take the one which is the most frequent of those because sometimes you need to decide the hierarchy of which of what you're going to approach uh, and I always want to approach the thing which is the most repetitive or the most consistent and the AccuTrack is a way of, uh, of mathematically doing that with without sort of the observer bias. Well I think this is uh, it was certainly a beautiful case that you showed us Tim and Mike 